Before we left, we decided that we were going to run some laundry in the dryer so we can come home to some uh, warm, comfy clothes. When we got back, uh, when we got back, it was not comfy. There were way more flames than we were expected to be there. May 6th, 2020. Black Mirror creator says the world is too bleak right now for season 6 to happen. There's no mystery. Are you nuts? <laughs> the mystery is, how could someone do that shit? It's what the fuck, it's giving me the details, and the details are so awful, it is irresistible. Why, it's season six of Scary Mirror, of course. It's interesting to run through episode concepts of Black Mirror that the creators might have scrapped at any stage in the making, especially in that sweet spot between the end of 2019 and lockdown that may have hit too close to home. We were basically given an extended episode that took us three years to get through anyway. Charlie Brooker even attempted to write an episode by giving ChatGPT a prompt to attempt to write an episode, which I think is what struggled way more. I've even secretly worked on a concept or two that I haven't known how to put together in years because it would only take me a couple of days to forget about and never update ever again. But one of my old files from 2020, See Your Memories, was based on a piece of AI technology put in your head that could let you see your memories play right in front of you. If you can remember being in a place before, and how old you were, or what you were doing, and you revisit that place again, it'll take that mental image of that version of you and display it in the world for you to watch as far as your memory can go. And then whatever you let the AI make up is just added to the memory. And that was really the end of it. But if I had to add a twist to it, gotta make it stupid complicated. You slowly stop making memories as your current self slowly gets addicted to finding more and more old memories you made which is unconsciously destroying the nostalgia and corrupting the visuals and audio with AI generated hallucinations that making you more afraid of losing those memories. And we can add timeless effects of ghosts and goblins to torment the main character. <laughs> or a fucked up seven year old you with no N64 anymore that swears, whatever. And the interactions between every ghost and goblin can either be frustrating, hilarious, horrifying, but unique dynamic, and you slowly find the way to each of their hearts or whatever, and restore them to what they were. Or, if I scrap that before they get the chance, and make it about me at the last minute, a self-report on myself, and condense years of life experience, hobbies, mental state, all in one Black Mirror episode, then I guess I've already done my research. Black Museum. The museum of secret criminal artifacts with terrifying backstories of experimental medical technology and transferring consciousnesses before being set on fire and forgotten. The episode. Side tangent on why Black Museum hits a little too close to my home specifically and sets it on fire and leaves it to be forgotten. The year is 2007. My family likes to reveal more from that day as years go by and it kind of shifts blame on someone else. <laughs> so my mom was the one who turned the dryer off and then left. Let's just get that out of the way. The kitchen and the living room were completely black. But my dad's computer and my beloved N64 right across from the exploding dryer. You can see it behind us actually in my favorite picture with me and my dad. And that's why while I'm gaming I've never placed a dryer behind me as a safety precaution. My home was the Black Museum of 2007 with the most dangerous artifact being my dryer setting everything else and itself on fire, destroying them. Ocarina of Time, maybe Majora's Mask on the N64, Hockey on the PlayStation 2, Link's crossbow training on the Wii, all gone. How would seven-year-old me ever cope if the next 16 years suddenly go by and a game like Tears of the Kingdom released? I don't know, I just made that up. And now it's 23-year-old me that couldn't even beat crossbow training. Nothing I lost was illegal or needed to be destroyed. They gave me great memories. I guess it was just the fact that what one seemingly harmless piece of technology did was the most damage that relates to the story in Black Museum. Black House, 2007. And only as recently as a couple years ago did the torment continue. Between October and December 2022, I had to get rid of my old phase cam. I guess editing 2013 diarrhea tier quality webcam for so long gave me a 10 year long bad quality hallucination that was so bad I Stockholm syndrome myself into believing nothing was wrong. And my Elgato game capture I gave to Curdy Birdie that he kept longer than I ever expected which is why I said he stole it by the way, so he could record his Dead Space remake. Maybe now we both know why so many months have gone by without a single Curdy Birdy gaming video since I gave it to him. Hopefully my bad audio quality that I haven't gotten rid of yet distorts those last six seconds so Curdy Birdy misses it. So I took a vacation to get away from that. The beginning of September we went camping, well, slept over at my Andy Brandy's mansion in their trailer outside, so kind of. And while I was there, I met some old friends, an N64, 
and Zelda Ocarina of Time on the N64. <laughs> the game that's tormented my mind ever since I realized my mind deleted those apparently unmemorable memories of 2003 and the game had nothing to do with it. It was three-year-old me that was memorable, and how much I couldn't be trusted to remember anything. <laughs> but Majora's Mask was Connor's favorite, so we chose that one. The day of Oot will come, and 30 minutes of Majora's Mask was just the right amount of almost too stressful that it was relaxing. But it wasn't as stressful as the Saturday before we did all that 75% less stressful stuff. The Saturday before, in the six hour drive to get there, I blasted through all of season six of Scary Mirror on the road. And that's when it led me to Loch Henry. The sleepy Scottish ghost town with a secret, which seemed like the most peaceful or least scariest episode until the secret creeped in. So Davis and Pia are getting ready to film their nature documentary, exploring the landscape, painting. It's like something from a painting. That's because people paint landscapes. So I guess it's time for us to meet Stuart, who apparently told us to never show our face in here again. I told you never to show your face in here again. You can walk right back out that door. No! What do I have to do to get a little small? Hello, Stuart. It's a shame he's dragged you out of London up to this ghost town, eh? Mm. Oh, the holiday atmosphere of a hospice. Which eventually brings us to the secret of why it's so dead in here, along with other victims, which is when they bring up Ian Adair. Picture it. 1987, this couple in their 20s hired a cottage for their honeymoon. They were here for about a week. Come the end of the week, they're supposed to have left. And all this stuff's still there. No sign of them, gone. So, of course, Dad gets called in. His dad was a local policeman. Yeah, she knows that. Oh, okay, sorry. But then weeks go by, and there's no sign of them, nothing. Until one day. One night, Ian Adair's drinking in here. In here? Oh, I drank in here all the time. Always oh, sat right there. It's so much creepier when the room you're in was part of a true story that used to have shit going down right beside you, but now that it's all over, it's just quiet now. He's had way more than usual. There's a poster of the missing couple on the wall. He even makes comments about the girl. And your dad? Yeah, they'll piss it. He tells Ian he's barred. Ian tells him to fuck off. He says he's got half a mind to come back and shoot the place up. So, dad asks Kenneth, his dad, Go and check in on Ian. I swear this was when Stuart was like, oh, by the way, his cop's a policeman. Oh, she knows that already. Oh, sorry. But it was a little earlier. But I just like the idea of this drunk man threatening to shoot up the bar, and he just has to go home and get his gun quick. And then this random dad, not a policeman, was just like, I'm gonna go meet him and talk things through. <laughs> Nobody with a quarter of a mind would do that. But this is where I thought we were. That's walking back to his car when Ian opens the upstairs window and shoots him. Sorry, he shot your dad? Yeah. Not fatally, in the shoulder. Bad though. <laughs> you look so fucking worried about. They just shot him. That's all. Uh, I don't know if you could tell, but that was me bragging. My dad meant to do that. He's hilarious. So dad crawling back to his car, calls for backup when from inside the house. Fatally, in the shoulder. Okay, now my dad's dead. Ian Adair shot his mum and dad, then himself. Pharmacide. Mm. First degree in Mer Adair. <laughs> While they're looking around the farm, they check out the cellar. Oh, God. And inside, it's like a torture room. This guy had been abducting people. He would make them record gaming videos with him. Horrible. I can't show clips of the real room, but yes, this random dad with too much time on his hands goes even more out of his way to finally find and explore the room tour of Ian Adair's torture chamber of doom. <laughs> yeah, that was Ian Adair. But that's not the end. But your dad, he recovered. I mean... Well, his injuries weren't that bad. He was in hospital for a couple of weeks. Right. But while he was in there, he got MRSA. And that killed him over time. I guess it was fatally in the shoulder. He was just being dramatic about it. His dad just won't stop being hilarious. So Davis and Mia take a trip to the murder farm to get their guns so they can go back and shoot the bar up. And seeing the house in real life where the dad got shot, 
unfatally in the shoulder, and then pretend fatally shot in the shoulder, and then real fatally killed by MSRA later, sparks an entirely new vision in Pia. I mean, I guess she forgot about the dad getting shot stuff, and that it was his dad that got shot and died, but they realize it might also give them a chance to tell a story that's been forgotten about and make people remember how much of a hero his dad was in this small, sleepy ghost town. And Stuart's mom seems to have all the research done for them. This is my mom's curiosity box. Michael here. I call it a morbidly obsessive collection. I mean, if you have an abundance of footage that's right in front of you, you might as well do some research. Just go to my videos, hit oldest, click the mouse wheel, drag it down, and you'll realize that I was one of many mental cases you never knew you were consuming. Terminally online behavior syndrome. Will she mind if we borrow it? Or she won't give a fuck, she's been dead for four years. My dad at me when I need him in a video these days. He's not dead or anything. He's just now only made up of old footage of himself since he moved out four years ago. Right, dad? God damn it, dad. Then we get a nice little compilation of them out getting shots, then going back home editing it all. I love that it gives off that sleepover at your friends vibe while the documentary is being shot and then edited later. Just like when Davis's dad gave off that vibe with the sleepover at Ian Adair's house while he was getting shot and then it was edited later. So when they go down to the production company, their reaction to their plot is that even though their dad got shot fatally, unfatally, then died for real, it's been done before and they need more than that. But a new updated room tour of Ian Adair's Torture Chamber of Doom revisited is what sparks their interest. So they basically tell him, go down there, go get some footage, don't die, unmask the villain who wanted everything for himself, and get out. Scooby dooby doo, where does he? He might be onto something. Fucking hell. Ian Adair wanted all the Scooby snacks to himself, but only the blue ones, and it made him afraid of being caught. So he abducted people to cover up the Scooby Snacks. Good thing he never ran out of them, or maybe he wouldn't have buried the bodies in the field. So after that traumatizing episode of Scooby-Doo ended before it could be banned, the shepherd's pie begins. They get in a car crash on the way home, as a prank. So after Stuart goes home, it's Davis trapped in the hospital, Pia upstairs listening to the tapes, and Davis's mom downstairs making shepherd's pie. And just like the ingredients you need for a shepherd's pie, all three of these scenes are cut together and playing concurrently. So, in my mind, it's gonna be poisoned or something. It's so ominous. Shepherd's Pia. Can't sleep, eh? Shepherd's Pie. It's ready. So please, sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself. I wish it were as magical as that. <laughs> so that's the kind of collab that'll get my parents involved. So Pia is forced to go downstairs to have dinner and survive one night without getting stuffed into a shepherd's pie suit. The bite! Pia makes it out and starts running down the road with her legs, trying to call Davis, but the murderer with the car beats her to it. But in a panic, Pia loses her in the tall grass, and on the rock she tripped over, and on the rock she fell onto. Good strategy. And Janet realizes that tonight might be the last shepherd's pie she'll make for you ever again. So she goes home, ends herself, but left the rest of the secrets and recordings of the murders on the table for Davis. And the end of her is what ends the production of the documentary, because it was just the right amount of almost too spicy for everyone watching that made it blow up because it ends up as the ending. Until it was too late, they never realized that this is what they could have prevented, but that when they did eventually vent, it would be too sus for anyone to comprehend. And the more months it takes me to make my masterpieces, the bigger the sus and chance the, the disappearance of Ryan and the cardigan will be made on me. So I'm going to get out of here before any of that begins.